my name is Michelle Renslow, and the group I'm with is White Light Research out of Auburn, New York. Um, total years or just with the group? <laughs> I've actually been doing it for quite a while. Um, my husband got me into it when we lived out in Arizona. So I've been doing it since actually probably since I was 15. Um, my first place I went to was uh, Wickenburg, Arizona, Vulture Mines. And that was on uh, Ghost Adventures crew. Went in there a couple years ago. And they did a thing over there. So that was the first place I went to that actually he took me to. So he technically got me started on my whole project here. But I've been doing it for quite a while. Quite a while. Um, it was mostly like history books. I was a creepy little kid who used to sit back in the middle of the library and get a book on witch hunting or ghosts. And I've always loved ghost stories, always loved Halloween. So I would seek out all the horror stories. And I was a huge horror story fan when I was uh, little. So any horror movies, anything I can get my hands on that would give you the, like the creeps, I would watch or I would read or I would do. So it, it's kind of, I grew up with it, basically learning how to do it. Uh, yeah, um, my husband hates the story when I tell it. Uh, my, I was, it was in 2005, we went to Gettysburg, and we actually were able to do some ghost hunts down there. And I told my husband, said, well, I want to do as many as I can, because I don't know how, when I'm going to come back. So we did about three of them, and we ended up in the cellar stories of the Farnsworth Inn about midnight. And we were going through the stories and everything, and I was quite relaxed. My daughter, who uh, does a ghost hunting with me, she was actually laying on my lap at the time. And she was dead asleep, and I kept feeling this tugging on my shirt on my left-hand side. Well, I started putting my hands up over my head, like checking for airflow and things like that. I was trying to debunk whatever was going on over here with my daughter in my hands, and my husband thought I was crazy. He's like, what are you doing? I told him, so I'm feeling somebody tug on my shirt over here. He's like, ah, oh, you just got the, the story's got to your head. It's midnight. You've done like three of them. We're tired. You know, it, you're all, you're just crazy. I said, no, I'm not. I'm feeling what I'm feeling, what I'm feeling. So towards the end of the, the ghost stories, the guy had noticed what I was doing and he made it a point to tell everybody that the airflow, the AC units were shut off because if not, he wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to hear the stories. So there was no air current in the basement. There was nothing. I was sitting in the last row, so there was nobody behind me. And I just got this sense of, okay, uh, it's now getting creepy around here. Well, by the time he finished his last story, I had anxiety. I was in a panic. I grabbed a hold of my daughter, my purse, my camera, and I went to stand up. My husband's like, well, you can't leave yet because he didn't open the door. I turned around to my husband and said, like hell, I'm getting out of here. So I picked her up. As soon as he opened the door, I mowed down six people to get out of the of the cellar. We we got outside. I put my daughter down, and I started crying and everything. And the guy comes up after making sure everybody was out, and he looked at me and goes, you all right? I said, yeah. I just I don't know what came over me, and it was just really weird. You know, I had the panic and the anxiety. He looked at me and he goes, are you sensitive? I said, well, after having my daughter, yeah, my hormones are out of whack and everything, so I don't I don't know what I'm doing. Half the time, you know, I, I do cry. He's like, no, 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 no. He goes, do you know when somebody's around you? I said, yeah, I can feel when somebody else is around me. He goes, do you have any problems in dark, creepy places? And I was like, no, why? He goes, well, you're sensitive. And what you were feeling was Jeremy. And Jeremy is the little boy who was killed by a carriage out in front of the Farnsworth Inn. And what had happened was they carried his body back into the Farnsworth and it took him three days to die. So after he had passed away, his father wouldn't give up his body. So the mortician and a couple of other people had to pry Jeremy's body out of his father's arms. So what I was feeling was Jeremy. And what he told me was that since I had two children with me, and I was the only person with two children on the tour, that he was quite jealous. He wanted to get my attention. And the only way he could get my attention was to tug on my shirt. So that was that was like my first real paranormal experience that, okay, I had to stop and think about what was going on. I'd say roughly about close to a hundred. 
some with teams, some without teams, some by myself, mm -hmm. uh, some with my husband. So to I think total in all, maybe a hundred or more. I just prefer the plain old camera and voice recorder. I'm <laughs> I'm old school. Um, the the ghost box has given me pareidolia, so I can't tell whether they're really sane or if they're saying something. So I normally don't use a ghost box very often. Um, I did try the echo box. It worked pretty good. I was able to pick up more with that than I would with a regular ghost box or an SB7. So I think the echo box, I might be using a little bit more, but I prefer just the straight up camera and voice recorder. Doing the research, doing the historical research. I'd like to walk mm -hmm. in, walk with the, walk around with the person. They can show me their personal effects and things and tell me the history and stuff. I mean, I, that's, that's the part I enjoy the most is because I like to hear the stories and stuff. A lot of times I'll pick up clues out of those stories. Um, we did an investigation. This lady was uh, showing me throughout her house and I'm noticing all these old pictures she had. Well, it was with, a, we were with, I was with another team at the time. And I said, well, let's let's do something really weird and let's spread out all these pictures and see if we can make a connection. And what I did was I took a pendulum and over um, the pictures, I would put the pendulum. And when the pendulum deviated, I picked up that picture and put it into a different pile. And it come up with five different pictures. And I was astonished. I'm like, wow, it's five different pictures here. And her and I took a look at these pictures and she said, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Look at the facial features. So her and I marked the facial features and we found out it was the same woman, but it was progression out of, throughout her whole life because she was born and she died at that house and she knew who the woman was. So I said, do you have a family connection? She said, no, I bought the house, but this is what the realtor gave us. So the, the picture of the little baby, the young woman, the mother, the grandmother and the the really old woman, it was the same, it was the same lady, but it was throughout her whole lifespan there. I thought that was the best, one of the best things that has ever happened because it was weird. It was creepy. I wasn't expecting it, the outcome the way it did and it, it had a good outcome. Not really. Um, we, my team members are trained to take precautions and that if they feel strange, if they feel sick, if they feel like, okay, something's wrong, they need to leave the area. So they're they're trained to leave the area, say, hey, I need to go and just walk out. Um, if When we're in a group, because we usually go two by two, if the other person says, I need to leave, we don't ask questions. We say, okay, we'll walk out and we'll take them outside. Um, we're more, I'm more concerned about hazards like asbestos um, with, with my group because we don't, no, none of us go through uh, investigations with hazmats and things like that. So I'm more worried about them inhaling asbestos or inhaling something like pigeon, uh, pigeon poo. Um, cause that can cause more damage than anything else. But yeah, with the, with the other side, I'm not too concerned about cause we all have our little different things that we do. Um, one of our group members, she does carry salt with her at all times. Um, one of the priests that I work with, where I work, he has some uh, holy water. He gives me once in a while. So I put like a little aerosol and I spray around if we need to. Um, so we do have our little protective spells. Um, some of us wear charms. Like if you can see, um, I have a pendulum or a pentagram. And I have a, uh, I just got at New Orleans, a, uh, an evil eye, basically. And this wards off all the negative negative spirits and stuff um it keeps them at bay so we all have our little little things that we use yeah get with a team that knows what they're doing because there are some teams out there that i've ran into that have no clue of what's going on and i'm not worried about them harming themselves but i'm worried about them harming the new people and harming the homeowners um a lot of times people don't do the proper research going in. Um, sometimes there's misleading evidence that really upsets the homeowners. I'm more worried about the new people that have no clue of what's going on, never had an experience, and they see it on TV and they go, yeah, this would be cool to do. Well, sometimes it's not very cool because 
there's been several cases. One of them was actually here in upstate New York where people have gone in, thought they, this was cool to do, and they've been harmed or, in a sense, possessed. Um, there was a teammate that had her, our team, uh, another team that had her, her son was possessed because he was doing this. And uh, it's real creepy out there. <laughs> and you never know what kind of type of people are out there anyways. Um, I, I would classify them all in the same class. Pendulums, dousing rods, Ouija boards, spirit boxes, um, message boards, anything that you use to communicate, you're opening a line of communication with the other side. So it doesn't matter what the vehicle is. Um, the, I call, I call it the telephone line. If you're going to use a Ouija board or a pendulum or a dousing rod, you're basically lifting up the phone receiver and saying, hello, I'm here to talk to you. Does anybody want to talk? So like with the ghost box or the echo box, I, I'm asking, you know, I'm here. I can talk to you. Would you please respond? So it's like picking up a telephone and saying, hi, hello. You know, you're going to get a response. And I just, I put them all in one category. It just depends on what, what you use and how you use it. Uh, not really. Everybody has their own little thing that they do. And as long as it works for them, I say use it. Um, some things don't work for me. Like I don't, I don't like the dousing rods too much because I shake, especially when I'm standing still, I shake really bad. So using a dousing rod wouldn't work for me. Um, using a pendulum, if I'm sitting down and I'm still, and I'm able to stay still, I will use a pendulum, but I won't use it very often. I call it my little parlor trick. Um, I'll do that. I'll do that just to press or just to rile something up. Um, I don't provoke. Uh, that's the one thing I don't do. I use respect um, because I'm talking to someone who was alive, who had a personality, um, who had a temperament. So if they were mean and nasty in their in their living life, they would be mean and nasty in the afterlife. And I don't go. I don't walk in and say, "Hey, listen, you fat." you know, SOB, would you want to talk to me and stuff? Because you're going to, you're going to get the negative instead of actually trying to open a line of communication, say, Hey, listen, I understand. Uh, would you like to talk about this? So I don't, I don't really provoke. I know when to provoke and I know not when not to provoke. Um, I really haven't come across anything negative lately. Um, I, uh, in I guess in New Orleans, I can, I guess I could say this out. We went on, my husband and I took our kids to go see their grandma and grandpa in New Orleans. And one night I had a bad dream to where I felt like somebody was choking me, but it, they just did, they didn't grab me around the neck. They just grabbed my trachea here. And when I woke up, I could still feel the fingers right in that area. I think, uh, I think that would be, uh, one of the worst ones I've ever come across. Somebody told me I had an attachment, so I asked her, I said, well, if I have an attachment, who is it? What did they want? Because as far as I know, nothing came back with me, but that was the only night where I had something bad happen, and I haven't had anything bad happen that bad, to where it would just wake me up out of a dream or wake me up to where I can still feel something in that area. Um, my theory is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we die and we, we don't, we don't, we don't change forms. We get absorbed by the environment. Um, we become balls of light. Some of them, if our personalities are strong enough, we'll stick to an area. Um, one of my places, if I was to ever die, I would be stuck out in Arizona. Um, I would go back to Arizona, probably to a piece of land somewhere up in the northern Arizona mountains and just stay there. That's where I would go. Or maybe even uh, uh, Gettysburg, <laughs> just to haunt some people down in Gettysburg. But um, I've, I've sat with people because I'm a nurse during the day. So I've sat with people and I literally watched them take their last breath and I felt their last heartbeat. And I've, you know, heard, heard and seen things that are like, okay, why is it doing that? So when I asked this, the strange questions, you know, why is the body doing that? It kind of made me wonder, okay, you're in the body, 
where are you at now? And that was one of my major, major questions. Like, okay, if we're living and we die, once our heart stops and our brain stops functioning, where do we go? Um, it just, to me, it seems that we don't go anywhere. We just stay here, but it's in a different form, different form. We, we take like a, an energy form. Our, our energy gets absorbed into the environment and into the areas. I would say I'm 50% uh, on that. I'm still a skeptic. <laughs> um, John Tobin had uh, recently said, you skeptic? And I said, yeah, it's just, I go in and if somebody says, hey, listen, my house is haunted, I'll look at them and go, yeah, okay, here, here's my business card. When you want me to come in, let me know. I will still go in on that skepticism that, okay, they have to prove that they are here. So they have to prove their existence to me. I guess it's kind of like an ego type thing that if I walk into a house and I'm like, oh my God, this place is so haunted and I feel all this stuff. And it turns out that I don't get any evidence. Well, you know, it's, it's subjective. I, I look for subjective and objective. If, if it's not documented to me, it's not haunted. And I don't label anything haunted unless I have to call John Zaffis or somebody major in to say, hey, listen, these people need help. Um, the most I put out would be paranormal, paranormally active. I will tell somebody, okay, I've gotten a couple of EVPs. I have some light anomalies. I have this, I have that. You are paranormally active. You're not haunted. You're paranormally active. And because my, my, my definition of haunted is the basic standard that if somebody's being pushed, you know, possessed, things are flying off the wall. You know, a mixture of all this other stuff. You're seeing apparitions here, seeing apparitions there. You're getting voices that are talking to you. I would say that is haunted. Um, but paranormally active, I use quite a lot. But as long as I'm getting the evidence, if I'm not getting the evidence, I'll say, you know what? We'll come in and try again. We do multiple investigations. We don't go in one night and say, yeah, you know, we saw the shadow walking down the hallway, but we tend to catch it on the VCR or we didn't catch it on the on the. Uh, the camera. So yeah, it is kind of haunted. I, I won't do that. It's cut and dry with me. It's either you got it or you don't. And if you got it, it better be on a voice recorder, better be on DVR, better be on video, better be something because I need that to back up the claim. And that's what, that's the way I use it. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, uh, somebody, a couple people had asked me to do a, uh, a web log or a vlog um, of some places that I've gone to. Um, some, some people have asked me to do videos of things and just explain the history. And I, I told them I probably, I'll try it and see. Um, I kind of can't commit to anything because I've got, you know, two kids in school. I've got one that had knee surgery. And like tonight, one had a... a uh, a band concert somewhere. So I'm trying hard not to fill my schedule up. Um, but in, uh, in April, I'm actually going to be at Salem con in Salem, Massachusetts with, uh, some of my team members. We're all going out there. Um, some of the team members have not been to Salem. So I told them, Hey, listen, you know, this is, uh, let's go. So we decided we were going to go out to Salem con April, uh, 10th, 11th and 12th. So we'll be out there. Um, our schedule's not really full yet. I need to get a hold of Bonnie from Palmyra, uh, the, the Palmyra and the Phelps store. So I need to get a hold of her and get her cup, get a couple dates set up with her to do some stuff. I'm going to be doing a ghost hunting, uh, one-on-one class out there with her. Um, so we're going to set some stuff up there. Uh, mainly it's just sticking around New York state and, uh, trying to see what we can scare up in New York state. What are 